Abraham Lincoln wrote very few accounts of his own life, just a handful really, mostly when he was running for president in 1860. The most important of these he actually wrote in December of 1859, and it was as the result of a request from a Pennsylvania newspaper for information about him that they could use to write a profile uh, of him along with other leading contenders for the Republican presidential nomination. And so on December 20th, 1859, Lincoln sent a note to Jesse W. Fell, who was the newspaper editor in Bloomington, Illinois, and a friend of his, originally from Pennsylvania, who was coordinating all of this. And the note is revealing in and of itself. He writes, my dear sir, herewith is a little sketch as you requested. There is not much of it for the reason I suppose there is not much of me. But if Lincoln was trying to be modest, um, it was clear that he understood at some deep level that this was being solicited because he was a candidate for president, a serious one. He says, if there is anything to be made of it, I wish it to be modest and not to go beyond the materials. He wanted it focused on the text. If it were thought necessary to incorporate anything from any of my speeches, I suppose there would be no objection. And then he adds something that's kind of interesting. He says, of course, it must not appear to have been written by myself. Lincoln was projecting an image of modesty. He was a modest man, but he certainly knew that he was a, a legitimate national contender for public office. The sketch itself is only about 800 words, and it begins, I was born February 12, 1809 in Hardin County, Kentucky. He notes that his parents were born in Virginia. He calls them of undistinguished families, second families perhaps I should say, instead of the first families, meaning revolutionary descendants. My mother who died in my 10th year was of the family of the name of Hanks, some of whom now reside in Adams and others in Macon County, Illinois. He notes that his paternal grandfather, also named Abraham Lincoln, emigrated from Rockingham County, Virginia to Kentucky about 1781 or two when a year or two later he was killed by Indians. And then Lincoln makes sure to note this. He says, not in battle, but by stealth, so that no one could confuse his uh, intention. In an era when people celebrated Indian fighters, and when some candidates for president ex uh, extolled their experience fighting Indians, Lincoln wanted to make clear that's not the kind of family he came from. He said that his grandfather was killed by stealth while he was laboring to open a farm in the forest. They were farmers. His ancestors, Lincoln writes, were Quakers who went to Virginia from Berks County, Pennsylvania. And then he notes that an effort to identify them with a New England family of the same name ended in nothing more definite than a similarity of what he calls Christian or first names. Now, you know, this is interesting. If you step back and look at that opening paragraph, what Lincoln has done in a very short amount of space is identify himself with leading states, Virginia, Kentucky, New England, Pennsylvania, Indiana and Illinois. This is a man who was uh, identifying himself with almost every region of the North, all of the regions in the North and the Upper South that might be the contested space for the 1860 presidential election. He goes on to describe his immediate upbringing. He says, my father at the death of his father was but six years of age and he grew up literally without education. He removed from Kentucky to what is now Spencer County, Indiana. In my eighth year, we reached our new home about the time the state came into the Union in 1818. It was a wild region, it, in, sorry, in 1816. It was a wild region with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods, he wrote. And then he says, and there I grew up. Then Lincoln talks about his experience with education. And here is where you have to decide for yourself whether Lincoln is proud of what he overcame or embarrassed by what he came from. He writes, there were some schools so-called, but no f qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond the readin', writin', and cipherin' to the rule of three. Cipherin' to the rule of three is a reference to the basic principles of geometry. He notes, if a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn or visit in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. Of course, when I came of age, I did not know much. Still, somehow, I could read, write, and cipher to the rule of three, but that was all. I have not been to school since. The little advance I now have upon the store of education, I have picked up from time to time under the pressure of necessity. Now, Abraham Lincoln clearly was interested in education. In one of his other public statements, he calls it the most important endeavor that people are engaged in, and it mattered to him. But he overcame a lot. 
However, it is tricky. If you look carefully at the original uh, image of this text, Lincoln crossed out reading, writing, and arithmetic and changed it to readin', writin', and cipherin', dropping the G's in a way that suggests he was either poking fun of himself or perhaps trying to seem country. Uh, it's hard to say for sure what he intended. We now know that um, Lincoln had more education than we realize. We always say he had about a year of formal schooling. Now it appears from recent copybook examples and texts that have been rediscovered that he may have had more than that. Still, almost all of us today are far better educated than Abraham Lincoln ever was. He goes on to say, I was raised to farm work, which I continued till I was 22. At 21, I came to Illinois and passed the first year in Macon County. And then I got to New Salem, where he says I remained a year as a sort of clerk in a store. Then came the Black Hawk War. This is the last Indian War east of the Mississippi. And when I was elected captain of volunteers, a success which gave me more pleasure than any I have had since. He says I went the campaign, was elected, and ran for the legislature the same year and was beaten in 1832. The only time I have ever been beaten by the people. Now, there's a couple of interesting things happening here. Lincoln is describing his work experience. He was a clerk in a store, he was a captain of volunteers for the militia in an Indian war, and then he was a politician running for office. He says very proudly that the defeat in his first race when he was 23, uh, and essentially a, a stranger in a new place, he had only been living in New Salem for less than a year, that he was that this was the only time he had ever been beaten by the people. And this is now something he's writing in 1859. He's very proud of his career as a success in politics. The next and three succeeding biennial elections, biennial meeting uh, every two years, I was elected to the legislature. This is the Illinois General Assembly, and he was a state house representative from Sangamon County. I was not a candidate afterwards. He writes, during the legislative period, I studied law, removed to Springfield to practice it. In 1846, I was elected to the lower house of Congress, meaning the U.S. House of Representatives. Was not a candidate for re-election. From 1849 to 1854, both inclusive, practiced law more assiduously, meeting more intently than ever before. What Lincoln just did, in the same way that he had identified himself with almost all the contested regions in the 1860 election, was identify himself with almost all the major occupations uh, in the 1860 census. This is a man who was raised to farm work. He became a clerk in a store. He trained as a lawyer. He was a politician. He served briefly in the military. This is what politicians do. They identify themselves with their constituents and they find ways to forge identification. And Lincoln is very good at it. He also does this with partisanship. What he says next is always a Whig in politics and generally on the Whig electoral tickets making active canvases. I was losing interest in politics when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused me again. The repeal of the Missouri Compromise is a reference to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. That was the trigger that realigned the political parties, broke apart the Democrats, and created the Republican Party. What Lincoln just did in those two sentences was identify himself with the Whigs and with the cause that mo mobilized anti-slavery Democrats to create this new party with the Whigs called the Republicans. What I have done since then is pretty well known. Then Lincoln adds uh, a personal description. He says, if a personal description is thought desirable, it may be said I am in height six feet four inches. He was extremely tall for his age at a time when the average man was about five foot seven. Nearly lean in flesh, weighing on average 180 pounds, tall and thin. Dark complexion with coarse black hair and gray eyes, no other marks or brands recollected. This is the best autobiographical sketch we have from Lincoln. It tells you an awful lot about him, um, not so much because of its detail, but because of its strategic use of detail in a way that helps illustrate how he had become, by 1859, such an experienced and effective political leader.